Hello, um, welcome new viewers and people who are used to good videos. Welcome back to a traditional, by taking it back to my roots, Denpa video where I respond to a fellow Denpa on some philosophical or political subject and ramble at a camera for a very long time with my ill-informed, uneducated ideas. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to be talking about education reform. I'm going to be responding to Osaka Syndrome's video on the subject, going through their points one by one, telling you what I like, why I like it, what I don't like, why I don't like it, and then giving my opinions for education reform and uh, spelling out why I hold those positions. Uh, I'm doing this because I'm very passionate about education reform. I actually forget how passionate I am about this subject. This is, a, I think, an extremely important issue that is overlooked in society because uh, things like youth rights and youth liberation is just uh, deprioritized. Uh, people, as much as they like to posture about uh, caring about children's futures, actually uh, don't think that much about education and schooling where kids are for most of the day. Uh, so uh, I want to stand up, stand up, you know, for the rights of... Uh, I remember how much school sucked. Let's just put it that way. Uh, so let's go through some of uh, Osaka's points uh, one by one. Uh, so the first thing they propose is to abolish multiple choice standardized testing. I think this is a pretty universally agreed upon idea that uh, multiple choice standardized testing is not a very effective way to measure academic progress or really do anything uh, useful at all. Uh, I actually think I can give some perspective here as someone who doesn't live in America. We don't have that here. We don't have uh, multiple choice standardized tests. Uh, when I did my GCSEs and my A-levels, uh, the tests were often very different from how I see American tests. Uh, rather than loads and loads of multiple choice questions, instead there were tests that were like, you have an hour and a half, there are seven math questions, but each of those questions is very complex, multi-stage question. Uh, solve these seven math questions in the time allotted, or um, solve these uh, English comprehension problems and so on, right? Like, rather than having uh, multiple choice questions, they were uh, different, you know, they were longer form answers and fewer questions, and not multiple choice, but more open-ended. And uh, this is the case in lots of countries other than the US, and uh, a lot of those countries tend to correlate with higher levels of academic achievement than the American schooling system. So I think it's pretty fair to say that the multiple choice question format of standardized testing in America is quite flawed. Uh, the next thing Osaka proposes is kind of a, a series of um, uh, solutions to address the problems of class inequality uh, in schooling, which I believe Osaka's idea is to tackle the problems of like class prejudice uh, at a young age uh, to help people to uh, get along with people in all classes and also to make sure that the upper classes don't have such a massive academic advantage over the lower classes by firstly abolishing private schools and secondly uh, just you know simple things like increased funding for uh, lower income schools in lower income neighborhoods and more schools in low income neighborhoods and uh, trying to create incentives for rich people to send their kids to the same schools as poor people so that everyone intermingles and then those rich parents are incentivized to fund and support the schools in impoverished areas. This sounds pretty good on paper. I think it's hard to argue against uh, increased funding for schools. Um, but I do have a couple of just points, uh, maybe anecdotally from my own life. Uh, so I went to well-funded schools my whole life, uh, and they were not good. Uh, I think this is something that people miss, is that just throwing money at the problem of schooling actually doesn't solve much. It can help in certain areas. Uh, I'll get to one area later on in this, uh, in addressing Osaka's points, that uh, increased funding would massively improve. Uh, but actually, uh, just having more funding for your school doesn't uh, necessarily equate to having better schooling. Uh, as an example, the second school I went to to do my GCSEs uh, was extremely well-funded. They they had 
uh, Macs for every student, in brand new Macs, uh, Mac computers for every student in every classroom. They had Raspberry Pis for every student. They had laptops for every student. They had uh, modernist uh, designed, uh, you know, school building with uh, decals on the walls and uh, all these sorts of things. And yet, uh, that school got shut down by Ofsted for being run so poorly after just three years of existence. Um, the t head teacher was embezzling funds, you had teachers teaching the wrong curriculum, teachers who were teaching fields that they weren't actually experts in or had any knowledge in, uh, massively, you know, some areas of uh, what you need to run a school were just completely ignored and therefore, you know, you had students ending up, uh, you know, in all sorts of weird situations in the school in weird situations, it was not good. Um, before I went to that school, I went to a private school, uh, i.e. a school where your parents have to pay money to go to them. Uh, and you would expect, again, that, well, so, I, I should clarify, the school I did my GCSEs in was a state school, funded by the state. And they had a bunch of money, and yet were very bad. Uh, now, the private school I went to, um, you would expect, would have a similar level of high quality equipment and resources, yet this was not the case. Uh, the private school uh, had really old computing, uh, computers, like really outdated technology, um, very slow, uh, no ability to, you know, revamp their technology. They didn't get the sort of electronic whiteboards that most other schools, state schools got until about five years after they spread across the country in the mainstream state system. Um, they never got new books for the library in any large or significant quantity. Uh, there were very few new hires and uh, stuff like that. Uh, however, what it did enable them to do is to hire teachers who were massively overqualified to be teaching kids at the level they were. For example, we had a, a science teacher who had a PhD in physics. Uh, in my opinion, this guy has no place teaching kids. He's being wasted teaching kids of the age that we were he should be teaching a university class. Um, you know, this this guy, th his skills are being wasted on uh, people who don't require the level of special specialized knowledge that he has. We need rather people who are uh, trained in a broader science education rather than a specialized PhD. Uh, you know, you had multiple teachers with master's degrees and very overqualified, uh, but did that actually help the quality of education? I would argue not really. I don't think that the students in that school were actually particularly better educated than this children in the state schools I've been to. Um, you know, the only actual advantage I saw from being in that private school in that, uh, was uh, smaller classroom sizes, because obviously fewer people could afford to send themselves, send their children to that sort of school. So you had smaller classroom sizes. Uh, that was pretty much the only advantage that I saw. I, I don't actually think that uh, the money went to anywhere good or useful, and, it, you know, in the other school I saw that the, the, despite having an abundance of money from the government, uh, it wasn't put to get any good use. So I don't necessarily think that increased funding uh, will actually solve the problems of schooling. Now, of course, this is just anecdotal evidence, um, and I don't have the experience of going to a uh, state school in a poor neighborhood as a kid to compare it to, uh, but I do want to give just my anecdotal experience here and say that, like, it doesn't necessarily mean that just because you put more money into schools, they're going to be better. Uh, I'm a living example of this is not the case. Uh, um, you know, I also think that this idea of making uh, rich kids and poor kids go to the same schools together, you know, I think this is a little utopian that to believe that this will somehow mean that people become less class prejudiced when you actually look at schools and see how much bullying and prejudice children engage in on a regular basis that um, you know even within schools where everyone is of a similar economic class there is massive amounts of bullying uh, in America for example I believe uh, on the basis of like what shoes people are wearing and what outfit how expensive the outfits people are wearing are um, you know uh, even within schools where everyone's of a similar class if you're wearing uh, bad unfashionable cheap sneakers uh, you are likely to be bullied by other kids or uh, have your 
expensive sneakers stolen by other kids. You know, this is the sort of thing that happens all the time. I don't think, you know, I think it's much more likely that if you have a situation where there are groups of uh, working class kids and groups of rich kids in the same school, they're likely to group together with people of the similar class and not actually have this sort of interclass utopian uh, exchange that Osaka wants. Uh, so next up, we'll get to some of the stuff that I think is extremely wrong, uh, based on some false assumptions that Osaka has. Uh, the first one is Osaka thinks school should be year-round, that there should be no vacations. Um, I'm going to get into my problem with this later when I talk about my points. Um, but I, uh, I disagree with this, uh, especially coming from a position where in Europe uh, we have much longer summer breaks than America does. America actually has quite short uh, summer vacations compared to Europe. Um, and, you know, coming from this place where you have summer vacations that are quite long, uh, Osaka's argument is that you forget a bunch of the knowledge that you learned over the course of the vacation. Uh, you forget a bunch of the stuff you learned the previous year. I don't remember this being the case, even though we had even longer vacations. They, there were very few lessons that were, like, wasted on refreshing students' memory of what we'd learned the previous year. Um, it didn't seem to have that much of an impact, really. Uh, if anything, it helped encourage people's social development outside of school, and again, I'll talk about that more later. Osaka also proposes longer breaks before cl uh, between each class. I agree with this. I think uh, that's a good idea. Uh, kids having more break time between classes is good. You need time not just to have input, but you also need time for that input to sort of settle in your mind. And during those break times, kids will have the ability to play and interact with each other, which will help their social development, and I think this is a great idea. Again, I will expand on this more when I get to my points. Um, next, Osaka proposes a more pragmatic approach to STEM teaching. Again, I think this is a great idea. Uh, right now, you know, having uh, lessons which are focused on actually creating things, you know, rather than uh, sort of all existing in the realm of the abstract, uh, but, you know, rather having people, uh, having children apply creative problem-solving approaches to real-world problems is going to help uh, them learn and them to understand the context of what they're learning, which I think is something that's missing from the education system. Uh, people, you know, children are learning things uh, without learning the context uh, as to why they're learning things and why it might be helpful. So having a more pragmatic approach uh, is definitely good. It will help with uh, knowledge retention and it will help people to have a broader understanding of not just what to do, but why uh, what they're learning is, is useful or correct. Um, so I'm definitely on board with that. <clears throat> Again, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that uh, in my, my, my own points, uh, but definitely agree with uh, more pragmatic STEM education. Uh, next is a couple of points about how to sort of narrow the gap, bridge the gap between students and teachers. So first, Osaka proposes that kids who are excelling in class should take on a sort of pseudo-teacher role to help uh, the kids who are falling behind. Um, and also that there should be generally more teachers and teaching assistants in each classroom. Uh, I think that this, uh, I, I agree that the, the gap between students and teachers should be uh, bridged, you know, that we should try and uh, make that gap less extreme. Uh, I think there are some other ways that I would like to address that, uh, maybe a, a slightly more radical. Um, but no, I generally agree with this um, in, t in terms of uh, kids helping each other. Although uh, I think the context in which it's done uh, should be a little different than what Osaka thinks. I don't necessarily know that this should take place in the, such a formalized setting, uh, but I don't think it's a terrible idea. I, I think it's pretty good, uh, a good way for the more advanced kids to put their uh, learning to good use and a good way to help the slower kids to catch up. Uh, as for having simply more teachers and assistants, uh, it's been demonstrated that having a better teacher to student ratio uh, does improve students' capacity to learn. Uh, uh, and it definitely would help if you have sort of questions or anything like that that you need help with. Uh, so that's probably good. However, I do think that there's a, there's a little more nuance to it than just throwing more teachers at the problem, especially when you consider uh, the authoritarian role, the disciplinary role that teachers have 
the position of authority that teachers have over children, uh, which doesn't help them learn, uh, and the possibility for the increased stress of the uh, constant surveillance and um, monitoring and threat of uh, punishment from increased uh, levels of authoritarian teaching uh, could be detrimental to children's ability to learn. Um, so I think you, I, I don't think it's a bad idea. Uh, I think it's a little more complex than that. You know, how do you actually get more teachers uh, is a little bit of a question that's left unanswered in that video. Um, in fact, that's generally something that's left unanswered is like how to pay for all of this uh, in classic leftist fashion. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'm joking, of course. Uh, uh, but yeah, I don't think it's a bad idea, all in all. Uh, next is something that I really do agree with, again, uh, which is mandatory civics, mandatory civics, ethics, and psychology classes. Uh, I'm not quite sure about psychology, but civics and ethics, I, I think, are a great idea to introduce to the curriculum, especially civics. Uh, people are going out into the world having no understanding of how government works at all, uh, which is just terrible. <laughs> you know, people deserve to be taught how the country they live in operates. Um, and right now we don't do anywhere near as good a job of that as we should be doing. I think this is an extremely good idea and should definitely implement, definitely be implemented. Uh, as for psychology, Osaka argues that it will help students to understand themselves and understand others um, in relation to sort of how they think. I don't think this is a terrible idea. Uh, there's a couple of problems with it. Firstly, I think psychology builds off of a little too much prior knowledge to be taught at a, uh, to younger kids. I, I think it's kind of the sort of thing where you need to learn a bunch of basic stuff about science before you move on to uh, psychology. There's also a lot of problems in psychology research, um, you know, in terms of like the reproducibility crisis and stuff, which is being dealt with. Um, I don't want to get too schizo about that. Uh, but, you know, it's maybe a... Uh, let, let's work out the kinks in that area a little bit before we start teaching it to kids, in case a lot of it turns out to be wrong. Uh, and finally, I think there are better ways to practically teach kids about um, theory of mind kind of uh, subjects and how to uh, interact socially and stuff like that, which again, I'll get into. Uh, so next, uh, this is something that I found kind of confusing. Uh, Osaka says that school should teach children how to recognize propaganda. Um, I'm a little confused about this because it seems like the only reason we even have public schooling in the first place is because uh, the public and private sector during the Industrial Revolution sort of colluded to uh, create public schools in order to indoctrinate children into the life of the subject and of the factory worker and the, the worker in general and the uh, citizen under a government. So you could argue that, you know, school's purpose, the reason school is even allowed to exist, is because it teaches propaganda. Uh, I think it's going to be very hard to uh, reform the <laughs> education in order to teach children how to avoid propaganda when the institution that is doing it is what is in large part responsible for propaganda. I mean, just look at how the Nazi party used uh, education and schooling to indoctrinate the nation into their ideology. Uh, it's very clear that schooling in large part serves as a uh, vehicle for propaganda, even in liberal countries, uh, given how effective it is. Um, and I, I, I find it hard to believe that the government would ever allow this to happen. Um, but moving on from that, the next point is something that I very much agree with. Uh, breakfast and lunch at school should be free, and they should be comprised of healthy foods. Uh, I think this is fairly obviously a good thing. Uh, you can't learn on an empty stomach. Uh, you know, lots of parents are in economically precarious situations, and it should be the responsibility of the state to make sure kids don't starve. I think that's a reasonable thing to expect of a state. Uh, so, yeah, I agree with that. Uh, on the subject of healthy food, I want to offer a little bit of precaution. So when I was going to school in the UK, there was a big push for uh, healthy food in schools. This was a big um, sort of campaign that was predominantly 
uh, headed by middle class moms. Um, and what this actually resulted in was uh, a pretty poor uh, development uh, as to sort of how how this was implemented, uh, because what ended up happening was the focus was more on eliminating sort of bad foods rather than, um, you know, positively uh, creating a well-rounded diet. So the focus was m much more heavily on um, sort of banning fast foods, which ended up sort of being foods associated with the working class and the poor. So stuff like chicken nuggets, burgers and pizzas were uh, phased out in favor of, you know, other more middle class acceptable foods. When in reality, there's nothing strictly wrong with eating burgers or chicken nuggets, uh, as long as they're part of a generally well-rounded diet where you're getting all your nutrients. Um, to, for the example of chicken nuggets, right? Like chicken nuggets are just reconstituted chicken. Um, there's nothing harmful about that at all. I mean, they're deep fried, but they don't have to be. They can be oven baked. Um, uh, uh, but you know, there's nothing un inherently unhealthy about uh, reconstituted chicken. You know, there's no difference eating a chicken nugget versus eating uh, a chicken breast and then drinking some soup made from a bone broth of a chicken carcass. You know, they're the same ingredients. Uh, it's just one is being, you know, more effectively used by industrial me mechanical processes to create uh, a nugget rather than a sort of traditional uh, home cooking approach of creating a broth out of the bones. It doesn't doesn't necessarily make any difference to the final nutritional content of that uh, food. Uh, so I think we ought to be careful of what we consider healthy and unhealthy food and how class influences our thoughts on that. And also, of course, race and culture. Uh, although these days people are a little better at it, uh, some of the older generation still is a little skeptical of foreign uh, foods, uh, non-white cuisines as being unhealthy. Uh, which is obviously bullshit. Uh, so I think we just need to be aware of that sort of thing, but and instead promote a uh, uh, a positive ad uh, additive process where rather than focusing on taking away unhealthy foods, we should be focused on uh, adding foods to round out uh, the diet of, uh, of children and make sure they're getting all the macro and micronutrients they need. Uh, next is... Um, uh, free pre-k I don't really have a problem with this although just like more teachers more funding more free pre-k free breakfast it's the uh, you know there is the question of who's going to pay for this um you know again lefties just want everything for free haha -ha. very funny joke um of course I'm sure Saka would just say have a progressive tax policy <laughs> um and finally uh, something I definitely agree with and I would push much further which is more electives, that uh, electives should, there should be more electives, they should make up a broader proportion of the curriculum, and they should have a more significant influence on your final grade. I agree with that, uh, and I would take it further. So, uh, overall, I think Osaka's video had some good points, and again, some points that I had some problems with, and I think a couple of these come from some fundamental misconceptions about education and learning. Uh, and I'll get into that into a, in a second. So first, uh, what I've written in big capital letters uh, on my points in my notes is uh, something that I think would be... Uh, the reason I've written it first and in big capital letters is I think that uh, this is the thing that we should probably be campaigning for hardest because it doesn't require totally restructuring the way that school works, uh, but it does... It, I think it would have a massive beneficial beneficial impact on society in general. Um, uh, and that is to completely reform math education. We teach math completely ass backwards and wrong. Uh, every mathematician uh, of a high level uh, agrees with this. They've been complaining about this for years. Uh, lots of people have been complaining about this and yet nothing is being done about it. Uh, mathematics should be taught like a creative field, like the arts, rather than as a field of rote memorization and calculation, which is actually a very, very small proportion of mathematics. Uh, the way we teach math right now is, imagine if we taught painting by telling kids to uh, completely recreate and color in the lines on uh, representations of the Mona Lisa or, um, you know, other famous works. Um, you could end up with a population 
that is really good at reproducing the Mona Lisa. You know, maybe uh, they start off in uh, preschool, they just learn to mix the correct colors to paint the Mona Lisa. And then in middle school, they have a sheet with all the lines written out and which numbers to correspond to which colors and they paint within the lines of the Mona Lisa. And they get to high school and it's like, okay, now we take the lines away and you have to paint the Mona Lisa from memory. It's like, that's how we're, you, you might end up with a population that's really good at reproducing the Mona Lisa, but they won't have learned anything about painting. You've completely missed the point. They will have learned very, very little about what it actually means, the purpose of painting, the purpose of, uh, the creative, expressive purpose of any of this stuff. They will, it, it completely misses the mark and misses the point of the whole field to do it like that. That's how we teach math right now. That sounds insane, but that's exactly how we teach math right now. Uh, math is a creative field all about problem solving um, and coming up with unique solutions uh, to uh, problems in the world and in the pure world of the abstract. It is not about memorizing formulas or calculation. Uh, we all have calculators in our pockets every day now. Um, learning arithmetic as the fundamental basis of all math is uh, not that helpful. <laughs> uh, you know, the the everything's backwards and everything's wrong. Uh, it's extremely boring and causes children to get completely fed up with mathematics, meaning that we, or every country that teaches math this way, is going to be falling behind in the realm of uh, high-level mathematicians. Because kids who might have had brains that were capable of becoming high-level mathematicians, might have had passions that could have been born for mathematics, are going to think they're going to be misinformed into thinking that mathematics is this thing which it's completely not. You know, if we taught kids that all painting was was uh, colouring in the lines of the Mona Lisa, you wouldn't be surprised that no one wanted to be a painter when they grew up. So no one wants to be a mathematician because we've taught maths entirely wrong. Uh, we have no understanding of how to get kids to intuit the actually really important parts of mathematics for daily life. Uh, if one of the points of schooling is that uh, the human brain is flawed and has various biases and misconceptions inherent to it, mathematics is a great place to explore those biases and try and challenge them. As an example, probability. There's a saying that the human brain only understands three probabilities, 0%, 50%, and 100%, that we just think every probability is that. Imagine if from a lot young age you were playing games of probability, games of chance, gambling type games with your fellow kids in the classroom to really ingrain what it means for something to be 70% likely or 2% likely or something like that. Can you imagine how many people would be saved from gambling addiction in later life if we really intuitively understood luck and probability from a young age like that? I think it would be a massive social good for society. And that's just one example. You know, there's a million different examples of how maths can teach you about your brain's inherent biases and the way the world functions. So mathematics reform, I think, is extremely important. And a lot of those things I've said can be extended to other uh, STEM fields like computer science. Um, you know, there's even an argument to be made that computer science and mathematics are, uh, like, th it's strange that formal logic, computer science, and mathematics are separated into these three completely different fields, when in reality they're highly, highly interconnected. But for some reason, formal logic is philosophy, computer science is its own thing, and mathematics is its own thing. Like, really, they're all kind of mathematics, uh... Uh, and a lot of other things are also kind of mathematics, but everything is governed by maths in some form, you know, music is mathematics, art is mathematics, language is parts of mathematics, you know, the, the way we choose maths is, is uh, we teach math is just completely backwards and it needs to be restructured from the ground up. Okay, so uh, my next point, uh, my next few points are going to be based on one uh, very important um, axiom, I guess, or... Uh, presupposition or, or maybe a, a flipping of the script on what Osaka believes, uh, which is that more time in school does not equal more time spent learning. I think people should really get this into their heads. More time in school does not equal more time spent learning. Um, schools are actually a very bad place to learn. Uh, schools are not structured in a way that makes learning good, easy, fun, useful, or, uh, you know, possible in any sense, really. Schools are some of the worst places you could possibly do any learning. Um, more time in the classroom does not equal more time spent learning, and this is why I strongly oppose Osaka's idea to abolish vacations. 
Um, and we'll get into why I think all of these things in a second. So the first thing I propose is that school should start much later in the day than it already does. Uh, there have been various studies that show that children's brains, if they wake up at, let's say, 7 a.m., uh, can't actually retain information and think critically and creatively until about 10 a.m. Uh, it just takes a while for your brain to get started. You can't really get any effective work done that early. Uh, in, gen in the general population, on average, of course, there are some people who uh, do work very well in the mornings, but uh, on a general population-wide uh, average, uh, kids uh, need some time to wake up for the first few hours of the day rather than being uh, forced into school. Uh, this also tackles another very, very important issue, which is sleep deprivation and schooling. Um, I think that what we do as a society to our children is absolutely abhorrent in this case of sleep deprivation. Uh, the only people who we allow to be sleep deprived are prisoners of war and children. Uh, I think future societies will look back at us as absolutely barbaric and evil for how we torture our kids and give them permanent brain damage and trauma by forcing them to sleep not enough. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I, it makes me kind of emotional thinking about this. The level, the amount of children right now who are uh, going through life in extremely stressful authoritarian environments on very little sleep and somehow being reprimanded for not being able to learn under these conditions. The first thing that sleep deprivation stops is your ability to uh, interpret information and retain knowledge. Uh, of course you're not going to be able to <clears throat> of course you're not going to be able to goddamn learn if you can't fucking sleep. And so school should start much later to give kids more of a chance to goddamn sleep because kids need more sleep than adults and adults aren't even getting enough sleep in the modern work culture, right? So kids should be getting even more sleep. There should be a massive focus on getting kids to have enough sleep every night. If you're going to say anything about increasing the quality of meals at school, sleep is more important than that. Uh, it's a massively important subject. Kids should be getting way more time to sleep. You should be, have a massive buffer zone for people's variations in their natural uh, <coughs> um, rhythmic sleep cycles uh, so that every kid doesn't even have the possibility to be sleep deprived. Uh, children should start school later because they need to sleep more and they need more time to wake up for their brains to get going in the morning so they can start learning. Um, Secondly, I think schools, uh, it, I think almost the opposite of Osaka, that kids need to be spending less time in school, that um, uh, it, there's a lot of uh, talk about a four-day four work week. Uh, the UK, for example, just had a massive trial, one of the biggest trials in the world, of a bunch of companies trialing four-day work week, and the majority of those companies, after the end of the trial, have decided to stick with a four-day work week because of the improvements they've seen in all sorts of metrics like productivity and so on. Um, it seems like the four-day work week is going to be the future, and I think we should be immediately starting to extend this down to the to children, that children should have a four-day school week. Um, because any possible uh, benefits that it could have in the realms of work that a lot of people seem to acknowledge these days uh, can definitely be extended down to schoolwork, 100%. They all are uh, mirrored in, in schools. You can see multiple studies that have shown that children learn better when they actually spend less time in the classroom. Um, and uh, another thing to add on to this is that we need to abolish uh, homework and uh, other busy work. Uh, again, this is going to help uh, people, uh, kids with sleep. Um, there have been studies that have shown that as little as 30 minutes of homework per night can have a detrimental effect on children's health from lack of sleep and from risk of obesity. Um, you know what, maybe I should clarify this a little more. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's not a good place to learn. School learning, I think people have a fundamental misunderstanding of how learning works, which is strange because we sort of already figured this out with how universities work. Uh, and people should apply what we already know from universities back down the stream to schooling. So uh, the way a university works is you go in for a lecture for a couple of hours, and the lecture sort of broadly outlines certain topics. You have a lecturer with expertise in those topics. They broadly outline those topics. They tell you what sort of textbooks to read, uh, what sort of study to do, and then the, that's not where you learn them. You learn a little bit there, you know, you might have some hands-on experience or whatever, but you really go to those lectures to learn what to learn. So this guy who's read everything in the field or, you know, in, knows how to communicate it very well is going to do that um, and they're going to interpret what you've learned last week. So let's say you read a couple of books last week, that lecturer is going to help you to, okay, here's how you might interpret 
this book, and here's what this guy and this guy and this guy had to say about this book, and here's a, a contrast with this other book. That's what the lecturer is going to do and say, now that I've contrasted it, go read this book this week and go do your study on this subject. And then you go off and you learn. This is when you learn, is you go off and you study on your own or with your peers. You spend your time, uh, you know, independently studying, researching, learning how to research, going to the library, going on the internet, reading books, reading articles, reading papers, learning how academic papers are written and how to pass them, learning how to write academic papers. You know, this is the sort of thing that people are doing in university, while also at the same time managing to pass with flying colours while getting drunk every day and partying all the time. Clearly, this me and yet they learn more in university in three or four years than they do in school, because a university degree is worth much more than a high school degree, right, in our society. Clearly, this is a very, very valuable time of learning. Even though they're spending a lot of this time, the majority of it, self-directed, and not even doing the active learning, socializing and stuff like this, right? Clearly, this is an easier, more effective way to learn. This is how humans actually learn. Uh, and yet... Uh, you know, you can imagine a university class where you never did any independent study and instead were handed out homework sheets and had seven hours of lectures a day would be fucking insane and everyone would be stupid. And it would be really, really hard for anyone to succeed in that environment. And yet that is the environment we give to children who have not got the capacity to self-manage uh, and focus for long periods of time because of their lack of brain development. Uh, you know, we give them the harder version. We give them the harder version. We should be giving no one the harder version, okay? The way the education works in university uh, clearly produces better results than the way education works in school. Um, <coughs> the only reason they're different is because ed uh, university educations are much older than school and were developed by people, upper class people, who actually wanted to learn and study. Whereas schools were developed by states and industrialists in order to train the next generation of workers. That's why we have these two opposing systems of uh, education, because one of them exists to educate and the other exists to indoctrinate. We need to, we need to do this, right? One of them needs to win out over the other, and we need to completely reformat the way we think about education away from the classroom. That the classroom is a hub, it's an important part. I don't want to abolish schools or classrooms or anything. It's a very important hub for learning, but it should be a hub that enables students, enables kids to go off and research subjects that they're passionate about. The purpose of school should be to encourage the innate creativity, the innate curiosity, and the innate latent passion in every child for learning, which I truly believe everyone, child or adult or anything, is wants to learn. I think humans are innately curious about the world. I know I don't say that much about innate human nature, but I think that curiosity is a part of innate human nature. Um, you know, and school should be there to foster this, to allow for this in the best possible capacity. If you want to learn about something in school, let me give you actually an anecdote. So we had a show and tell in my primary school, year one, okay, I was six years old. We had a show and tell, okay? Um... I went to the forest, it was autumn, and I picked up a leaf off the ground that had fallen from a tree, and it was a brown leaf. And I was like, this is a cool looking leaf, I'm going to bring this in to show and tell. Okay, I, I have autism, if you hadn't noticed. I was like, this is a cool looking leaf, I'm going to bring this in, this is fucking cool looking leaf, I'm going to show the class this cool leaf, okay? I'm the world's most autistic man, <laughs> maybe not, but uh, I brought in this leaf. Another kid for show and tell, he brought in a microscope. I asked him, because I was curious about this microscope, can I look at my leaf under your microscope? He was like, sure. I put the leaf in under the microscope and I looked through it. <laughs> Holy shit! This leaf has all these structures and sort of vein-like um, connective tissues and cell membranes. And I couldn't see, it wasn't that magnified that I could see the cell membranes, but it had all these sort of structures that look like veins, like a miniature tree inside of this leaf and all of these crazy colors and shit. And I was like, holy shit, leaves are made up of all of this crazy stuff. Who knew, who the fuck knows about this? Like what the fuck? I'm six years old. I don't know that leaves have, you know, 
these crazy structures inside of them. Uh, and I'm like, holy shit, this is blowing my goddamn child, six year old mind. You know, this is what, this is, that's learning. What I just did there, that's the best possible way to learn. Because then what you do, what should happen, is I should go to the teacher and I should say, holy shit, look, look at this fucking leaf, bro. And the teacher should look at it and be like, that is crazy. And I should be like, why is it like that? Why is the leaf got all of these, like, fucking things in it? And the teacher should be like, I don't know. Let's find out. Like, let's go to the library and find a book about uh, fucking plant anatomy. And then we should go to the library and find a book about that. Or she should be like, uh, I don't know, but we do happen to have a biology teacher who might be able to teach us. Let me call her up. Oh, hi. Uh, come come to the classroom, biology teacher from next door. Oh, hey, biology teacher. What do you think about this leaf? Look at the structures under the microscope. What do you think? And she'll be like, oh, well, you see, those structures exist to transport water up from the, the roots. And, and then I, as my little child, will be like, so... How does it happen? Does the water just want to go up on its own? And then she'll be like, uh, no, it happens because of capillary action. And then I'll be like, what's capillary action? And then she'll be like, oh, well, here's the physics teacher to come and teach you about uh, capillary action. Like, and then it blossoms into this whole wonderful, amazing world of knowledge and education. And, you know, just because, let's say, you know, not only do we have a four-day school week, but we have a four-hour school day. Okay, so I have four hours of classes, but that doesn't mean I'm in school for four hours. It just means I have four hours of classes. I might be in school for eight hours in the library, on the computers, talking to the teachers, talking to my peers, playing games with my peers, right? Like I could, it's socializing, you know, there's all of these crazy things that can go on at school and, and education. And, you know, if you have the opportunity for a kid to have an experience like that with my leaf, but instead of being shut down where it's like, well, that's the end of that. I looked at a leaf. It was kind of weird. And now it's like, where do I go from here? I would, like, how do I find out more? I don't know. I'm a six-year-old, you know, and then I just sort of forget about it. That's pointless. The, we want those little minute moments that happen in every child's life to be explored and produce, you know, a, a version of me at six years old who suddenly has a passion for botany or um, biology or, or, you know, physics out of this one tiny leaf, you know, and, and those sorts of moments of curiosity about the world happen across the board, across the spectrum to every child, and they need to be encouraged by teachers. And that's what school should facilitate, rather than uh, sort of giga structured lessons because that's how you learn you can't there is no learning without passion you there's memorization you know if you get a rat and you torture it it will learn but that's not a good way to learn it'll learn to fear pain that's all you're learning if you're learning in a disciplinary environment like that all you're learning is to fear pain you can't learn under threat of punishment it's impossible because learning is all about passion. Learning is all about curiosity and passion. You can't be curious under threat of, 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 of punishment. You can't be curious in that environment under the constant observation of authoritarian, uh, author, you know, uh, disciplined figures and uh, uh, in extremely structured classrooms where uh, you're forced to sit still and become obese uh, for, you know, six hours a day, memorizing... Uh, facts from history or mathematical formula you can't that's not learning none of that you don't learn anything from that you know how you learn you go in your break time you know you you're, you're in you're in class then you have break time and you go out to the playground and you play football that's how you learn you learn more about your fellow man and yourself from playing a game and you know when I say games you know I mentioned games earlier you put you might have thought that I'm talking about like Oh, we can play math games. We can play spelling games, you know. No, no, no. I'm talking about, like, just game games. Tag. Flash games. You know, computer games. Uh, football. Basketball. You know, game games. This is what Osaka wants to be taught in a psychology class. I think can be taught much more effectively by having a more open-ended school environment that encourages... That is... That is... Pardon me. That is not antisocial because school, as it exists right now, is antisocial. You can't have real social interactions um, and real, authentic uh, peer, creative progress, and you know, friendships and relationships and so on uh, under threat of violence. It can't happen. Um, 
you know, it's not, it's, you're going to have these weird fucked up interactions of bullying and uh, even in extreme cases, you know, people who are shooting up schools and stuff like that, uh, not as a consequence of these individuals being, you know, weirdos who don't fit in, you know, or anything like that, but rather because uh, that's what they've been taught to reproduce uh, by the adults. Because th that's all adult. That's all, that's what all the teachers are doing. They're they're essentially bullying the children uh, every day in school. They're teaching them the the behavioural pattern of bullying by uh, constantly uh, threatening punishment for any action that it you know might constitute real learning or creativity. Uh, uh, any you know rebellious kid in school who decides to be truant or to act up in class or whatever is actually saying. There's something in the system that doesn't gel well with me. Like, there's something about this that isn't sparking my creativity and my passion. Uh, you know, that's not the kids... The kids not shouldn't be punished for that. The fucking teachers should be punished for that. That's their fault. It's your job. It should be your job to, to ex experience humility. I'm sure we've all had this experience where in school you ask a teacher a question and they laugh at you for being stupid or uh, dismiss your question because they don't know or maybe tell you a wrong answer. I know I've had that where I asked a teacher a question and they gave me an answer that I later found out was just completely made up bullshit. This is fucking evil. These teachers, uh, the number one trait that a teacher should have is humility and uh not to see themselves as superior to the children, but rather as enablers of uh, these children to uh, express their innate creativity and en enable their learning. Because children are fucking learning machines. They can't help but learn about the world. And so if you put them in an environment of nothing but discipline and control, then they're going to learn discipline and control. And they're going to reproduce those behaviours against the other kids... Uh, and they're going to reproduce those behaviors in their adult life. You need to completely restructure this so it's much more open-ended and self-directed. Uh, uh, and when I say self-directed, I don't mean it would be independent. I believe it would be highly, highly social, just like, you know, depending on any particular kid's level of uh, introvertedness or extrovertedness, you know. Uh, <clears throat> it's much more fun to study in groups than it is to study alone. It's also much more effective to learn in groups because, uh, you know, different people understand different things in different ways and can explain them to each other. And learning in groups is very fun and useful and, and good and should be encouraged. Um, and I think that's how it would work, right? Because if you discover, you know, just like how I, I found this leaf and I got this other kid's microscope, you know, maybe this other kid would have looked at my leaf and also been like, holy shit, that's fucking crazy. And then we both go to the library and we both look up plant biology together. Or the teacher comes in and the, the biology teacher explains this to both of us. You know, there's a million different ways it could go. Um, that's the sort of thing that should be happening in school. Not homework. Right? Not fucking homework. You can't be curious about the world if you're spending three hours a fucking night doing worksheets, which I should mention, I know I'm 48 minutes in, and I'm only now mentioning any empirical evidence, but homework is very well studied and uh, constantly shown to do nothing. It's constantly shown to only do harmful things. It never correlates with academic success. The amount of homework people do and how well they do on that homework has zero correlation to a actual life outcomes except for obesity. That's it. That's the only thing it correlates to is if you get a lot of homework, you become obese. That's the only fucking thing it correlates to. It needs to be abolished. Um, you know, and I'm not the first person to say this. There have been people going back to the fucking 1800s who have been saying this, okay? Like, it's an insane, antiquated system that doesn't help reinforce the knowledge you learn in the classroom. The only thing that helps you retain knowledge is passion. You can't be forced under threat of punishment to retain knowledge. You retain knowledge about stuff that you're passionate about, that you actually want to learn about, because that's how the brain works. You, you, your brain puts things into long-term memory that it thinks it wants to keep hold of, and that's called interest. When your brain thinks it wants to keep hold of something, that's called being interested in something. Uh, if kids are forced into classes that they're not interested in, and by the way, I should clarify, I don't think that this means there should be no mandatory classes. As I said, you know, civics and ethics and probably mathematics and uh, some sort of literature or broader media studies type of uh, media literacy uh, classes, maybe even language classes, um, are, should be mandatory. 
but this doesn't mean that they need to be as as uh, overly structured and compartmentalized as they are right now. I think, uh, you know, you can have a civics class, which is uh, just people, just like a lecture, where you talk about some, some aspect of civics, but then the actual learning that kids do outside of that lecture, either in school or at home or with each other, um, can be on a broader array of topics that that individual student is interested in. And just like in university, when you present your final dissertation, you do literature reviews and even original research and stuff like that, there's no reason students of younger ages can't do the same thing. There's no reason they can't do the same thing. There's ab No one can present me with a reason they can't do the same thing. Uh, kids love doing shit like that. Um, and, you know, I, I, you might make the argument that, well, like, well, you know, if you actually give kids free reign, you know, you give kids computers in IT class, and what do they do? They spend the whole class playing Flash games. I'm sure we all did that growing up. And somehow this is evil. I'm sorry, if you can explain to me why it's bad for a kid to be playing Flash games, uh, as opposed to that same kid, for example, spending the class reading a classic work of literature or uh, watching, uh, I don't know, fucking Solaris or <laughs> Stalker or some some classic work of film or reading Shakespeare. Like, how come Shakespeare is taught in school as this masterpiece literature stuff? And I like Shakespeare, don't get me wrong, I'm not here to shit on Shakespeare. I fucking love Shakespeare. Thankfully, I had a really good English teacher who taught Shakespeare in a good way. Um, you know, but why? how come Shakespeare is taught in school and that's somehow worthy of study, but uh, the, the Flash game that this kid is playing, which has an amount of artistic input into it and can be studied and examined, and you can even study it and examine it to show how it's not very good, you know, to critique it like we do when people are older with media analysis. By the way, you know how many fucking kids spend hours watching video essays about media analysis on YouTube? Why are we not teaching them this in school? You know, like, why is one somehow valid and worthy of t uh, being taught and one is somehow procrastination and needs to be eliminated? Like, what's wrong with a, a kid who becomes really passionate about playing uh, fucking flash games in the back of class? Maybe that kid goes from being passionate about playing flash games in the back of class to being passionate about playing, uh, I don't know, Valorant to being passionate about practicing Valorant, to joining a Valorant esports team, to having a career in esports, to then, you know, retiring from esports to become a coach, to owning an esports team. Like, that's a career path. Or, what's to say that that kid plays a bunch of Flash games in class, uh, learns about, the, uh, the teacher comes over and says, do you know about Flash? Or oh, actually, modern computer, let's say you, Unity games, right? Like, so. Oh, Unity? Well, actually, in the IT room, you can go and we have Unity on a computer, and the, the IT teacher, he'll gladly teach you how to use Unity. And then he goes, and he becomes a game designer. Like, there is no bad thing that kids can be doing in school. Even something just like, actually, we just want to play tag for four hours. Like, you're exercising, so you're not going to become obese, and you're going to become, you know, a healthier person. You're interacting and developing, you know, increasing your social development and friendship and so on there is no bad thing kids can be doing in school if you've got a kid who loves to graffiti all over the toilets give him a fucking paintbrush and an easel motherfucker or like a spray spray can and you know whatever let him do his graffiti that's his art like right like there's no thing that a kid can be doing in school that is wrong or bad or uneducated Kids in school are desperately trying to learn. Everything that kids do to mess around, like playing games or doing graffiti or, um, you know, bullying or all of these bad things, being truant, you know, all of these things that kids do that is bad and punished are actually kids desperately trying to learn, but in an environment which stifles them. If they're playing games, if they're, you know... Uh, doing graffiti or doodling or whatever, they want to learn. If they're bullying, they're recreating the systems that they've been shown and trying to learn the systems, which are bad because kids can't help themselves but learn. <coughs> Excuse me. i uh, got a sore throat. I've got a cold. Um, you know, if, if, if kids are doing all of this stuff, they're trying to learn. They can't. They're being held back by school. Uh, time spent in the classroom does not equal sp time spent learning. 
classroom time should ideally be as efficient and minimized as possible so that kids can get out of the goddamn classroom and actually spend time learning. Um, this is why I think that the Osaka's idea of having no vacations is absolutely fucking ridiculous. Um, you know, at school, there should be no separation between vacation and school, uh, because school should be four hours a day, four days a week, and, you know, that amount of time that you spend could be spent doing whatever you're passionate about, and you might argue, well, what if a kid, you know, fucking spends their time in school, uh, you know, maybe playing Flash games, but then decides they don't want to be a game designer, that's fine. There are plenty of adults who go to university to study something and realize that they want to drop out and aren't interested in pursuing that career. They should have the opportunity to change what they're interested in. That's the point. The point is, you're not. You're probably not going to discover your actual ultimate passion for biology at six years old by picking up a leaf off the floor. You're probably going to get into that for a couple of months and then move on with your life. But we don't give anyone the opportunity to explore the fucking wonders of the world and all of the in amazing things to be interested in, in uh, you know, to, to study and uh, learn about the world because we focus in on these tiny little slivers of tiny little subjects that some bureaucrat somewhere has decided it's important. There's nothing more important than the process of learning itself. You're in school to learn to learn. Because then when you're an adult, you can retain that curiosity, you can know how to verify uh, sources and, you know, research things for yourself and be, in, in t you know, continuously curious about the world, which is something that I, that is, uh, you know, a general good for society. Uh, you know, rather than strictly teaching kids, here's how you recognize propaganda, just don't propagandize to them. You know, give kids the ability to research stuff on their own. And they won't need to learn how to recognize propaganda because they will already have known the basics of, like, what makes a good source? What makes a source reliable? Uh, how do you research uh, counterexamples? And what is a, a valid scientific method? And so on. Because, you know, that's what you need to be teaching to kids is how to research stuff on their own, which you learn in university. And you somehow have to cram all of that into, like, the first year of university uh, when everyone's already out partying and whatever. If it's that fucking easy to learn that you can be drunk half the time and not show up to lectures and still figure it out and pass, why do we have to wait until they're, you know, it, adults to teach them this? Why don't we teach them this when they're at the youngest possible age they can even begin to figure it out and continue teaching them the nuances of this? all the way until adulthood. By the time they go into university, they're going to be super well equipped to deal with the challenges the uni might might hand to them, you know. Uh, and then uni can be as structured as it is. School needs to be even less structured than uni. By the time you're an adult, you have self-control and discipline and a little more frontal lobe development, right? Uh, uh, impulse control and stuff like that. That's when you have the capacity to do a more directed study and, you know, Rather than just reading whatever book you're interested in, the teacher tells you to read a specific textbook, and you read that goddamn textbook because the teacher knows more than you, uh, right? <clears throat> like, there are circumstances where that's appropriate, but that's the harder thing to do that should be left until more advanced, you know, humans, <laughs> more adult uh, humans who are more educated. That's the, you know, that's the further end of the spectrum. Um, you know, study should just broadly be voluntary, even though the, like, umbrella of which subjects are taught should be mandatory, if you understand what I'm saying. Um, and finally, I think we need to do something about uh, teachers and the amount of power they have. So I did comment on this, that, like, school is this disciplinary system, and how this makes it really hard to learn and encourages bullying and even worse things like school shootings. Um, <clears throat> you know, uh, but even in a smaller scale environment, it just makes it hard to learn. Uh, you know, there are, there are teachers, you know, there are many teachers who really do uh, want to teach for the, you know, to try and help out the next generation. But there are also many teachers who just sort of power tripping and want to feel superior to children. Uh, you know, if you fail a life and you somehow want to feel superior to someone and punish someone, uh, then become a teacher. Uh, you know, hey, I'm not even going to fucking mention, let's just broad, let's just real quickly move past how many teachers are arrested for sex crimes each year, okay? That is a fucking epidemic of teachers arrested for sex crimes, and that's just the ones that get caught, okay? It's a serious fucking problem. Um, <clears throat> you know, like, this this whole setup is not good. 
uh, the kids should be the ones that are in power. The teachers are just there to humbly enable and encourage uh, the kids to learn. The qualities of a good teacher shouldn't be, uh, you know, thinking they're right about everything or smarter than the kids in any way, but rather being someone who is really good at communicating with children, like like knows how to communicate and help each ch child with their particular needs. That should be their what they're an expert in. They should also be able to defer. The f most common thing a teacher should say is, I don't know. That they should say like, well, I don't actually know about that. Uh, let me, let's find out together, you know? And it should be a collaborative process where everyone's learning, right? You, if you go to your kid, your teacher and you ask them a maths question and they just, you know, the, the only two responses you're going to get right now are either the answer to the math question or figure it out yourself. That's not fucking helpful to anyone, right? What you need is a teacher who's going to say, like, um, you know, maybe, uh, as Osaka pr proposed, like, ask uh, this other kid in class. You know, ideally, you don't even have to come to me to help. You can uh, work together. This idea of, like, independent, you go into school and everyone's fucking silent working on their own piece of paper is so stupid. You know how actual academic research gets done? In groups of people communicating and working together. Everything in the world is groups of people communicating and working together. You think NASA launched the fucking man to the moon by having one guy sit down quietly and write out all the maths equations? No, they had huge rooms of scientists coming together and communicating and solving problems together. That's how you need to teach it. If you have a difficult math problem, open it up to class discussion, you know? Have every student come together and propose their solutions. If you do this, oh, then you can do that! That makes so much sense, thank you! You know, have everyone work together to solve these problems. It doesn't have to be maths, it can be anything, right? Uh, you, you read a book for class, you read of mice and men or whatever, and you can have, all, your class can literally just be a book club of all the kids discussing the book they read, you know, and you don't, and you don't have to ruin books like they ruin books in school, where there's like one correct interpretation, or where, you know, you read a book ridiculously fucking slowly over the course of ten years. Right, like I read of mice and men, I went home, I read it, the next day I come back in school, it turns out we were only read to, supposed to read the first chapter. We went through each fucking chapter over the course of a week. A week spent on each chapter of Mice and Men. It's a good book. It's not that good, okay? You don't need to spend a week on each chapter. It's a short fucking novella, right? You don't need to do that. Uh, there's much, you know, this is insane. This is ridiculous. Um, you know, ha of course no one fucking reads books because we teach books wrong. Uh, you know, no one should be forced to read a book they're not interested in. Uh, if you, 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 forcing people to read books is so stupid, you can't just be like, oh, well, we want a more literate society, so we should force people to read books. That's the worst way to get a more literate society. Instead, provide people with books that they're interested in, rather than forcing everyone to read the same goddamn books that might appeal to some people and not appeal to others. And whatever you do, don't tell them how to read it or how to interpret it. Don't tell them you know, to read it over the course of the fucking a whole year, or one chapter a week, or it's just gonna get boring, you know, it's so bad. And don't, like, you know, have this hierarchy of art where some forms of books are, like, great literature and some forms of books are terrible. It's true, kids have bad taste in media a lot of the time. You know, I fucking loved YA novels when I was a kid. Do you know how amazing it would have been if the teacher at my school had been like, oh, you're reading The Fault in Our Stars? You know what? Has anyone else read The Fault in Our Stars? Let's just talk about that for a while. Anyone who hasn't read it, you can just go off and, you know, do whatever else you, you're interested in. Uh, let's have these guys just talk about The Fault in Our Stars for a couple of, you know, for an hour. And then we talk about it. And we recommend each other books. And the teacher recommends us books. And everyone just likes books, right? It's just a bunch of people who love books. That's an English class. That's fucking sick, right? Like, you have, you have like, oh... Yeah, this bit in the fault of our stars, and then you can have the teacher come in and be like, well, actually, you know, I personally didn't like that bit that much, because I thought blah, 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 and then the kids have to articulate why they like what they like, and that teaches media crit media literacy, which is something that is wildly lacking in the whole fucking world right now, that no one seems to be able to do media literacy properly. Well, if you actually have kids have to defend their opinions, rather than just try and guess what the teacher's opinion is, or what the curriculum's opinion is, then maybe people would have good media literacy. So, time spent in the classroom does not equal time spent learning. We need to have less time in the classroom. We need to have more open-ended education. We need to have less power 
you know, disciplinary, authoritative, punishment-oriented power in the hands of teachers and more power in the hands of students to teach them how to learn rather than teaching them <coughs> to, uh, to memorize under threat of punishment, teaching them how to not get punished. We don't want to teach them how to not get punished. We want to teach them how to learn. Um, and, uh, you know, reform maths education, reform uh, English education, uh, you know, uh, abolish homework and uh, start school at like midday or 10 a.m. at the least. Uh, I think those are those are some good ways to, there's a good place to start. Good place to start. It's like cars, you know, it's like one of these counterintuitive things where it's like, you know, everyone was sitting there for so long. Like, well, if there's traffic, you just need to build more lanes in the highway. That way there's more space for cars. But what that actually does is it just creates more demand for more cars and the traffic doesn't actually get improved. In order to actually decrease traffic, you have to make it harder for people to drive, which is counterintuitive, but it turns out it works. In the same way in school, in order to actually improve education, you need to make it easier for people to learn by making less time spent in the classroom. Uh, there you go. That's, that's, my, that's my schooling takes.